Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the From Adversity to Abundance podcast. I am your host, Jamie Bateman, and today I'm thrilled to have a new friend of mine, uh, acquaintance and friend, uh, Mark Livingston, on the show with us. Mark is the CEO and founder of Match Real Asset Partners. Uh, Mark, how are you doing today? Doing well. Um, you know, it's the end of the year here, early next year, thinking about goals and all that. So this is, this is a good time. Absolutely. Yeah. I've enjoyed this week to uh, it's a little bit, sl you know, slower in general, uh, get caught up on some, some things, but not, not grind quite as much myself. Um, but uh, yeah, we're recording on uh, December 30th. So it's a fun time of year to look back, but then also look ahead. Um, now you're in, you're in Texas. Is that right? That's correct. In Houston, Texas. Nice. What's the, what's the weather like right now? Uh, now it's good. We're back up in the 60s and have some nice weather here for a few days after almost freezing to death for us anyway, <laughs> at, yeah. around Christmas time. <laughs> it's all relative, I guess. We yeah. in, Mar in Maryland here, we got we did get into the single single digits for a few days there. But um, so now for the listener out there, who are you? What are you up to today? And, and why should we listen to you? Well, most of my career is a corporate career. Um, I have a degree in accounting. I am a CPA. Uh, over the last 37 years or so of, of work, um, I've worked in various auditing and corporate accounting positions. Today, um, I, I still have a full-time position. I'm the chief accounting officer at a public company, and you can look that up on LinkedIn, but this is not about that job, but, but I still do that. But what does that mean? That means I'm responsible for all of the accounting, all the tax compliance, all the tax strategy, financial analysis, all the financial reporting to the public for that company. Um, and in fact, I signed the 10K that gets filed with the SEC. So I'm well aware of uh, staying in compliance with financial regulation and all that. Mm -hmm. But um, although I am a CPA, I don't want people to think I'm a tax expert because I don't, I'm not down in the details of the tax. Uh, I didn't mm -hmm. come up with tax departments. So, um, yeah, it's it is, it is general accounting. It, it is kind of, you know, I think we do this with a lot of professions and a lot of industries. We all think, oh, CPA, he knows everything about taxes. And, yeah. you know, I, my CPA is fantastic, but I've thrown so many things at him that, he's never dealt before dealt with before and he's got to check with his tax partner or whatever else and doesn't yeah. mean he's not an expert in what he does but um but yeah there's so many nuances within every industry uh that it's impossible especially with the tax code being so yeah. onerous but that's a different topic um <laughs> for another day <laughs> um so and now before we jump back into your backstory um as far as outside of your profession, uh, what are you what are you focused on today? So I do have um, a, a company, Match Real Asset Partners, is the brand that I use, um, and I use it to invest for myself, um, separate from the traditional Wall Street um, methods, and I also help others uh, invest in those types of assets as well. Got it. Now I'm really excited to dive into that in, in a little bit here. Um, you know, I run uh, a couple of different mortgage note funds and, um, you know, I hadn't really a few years ago before I jumped into kind of starting funds and things like that. I hadn't really ever considered, I think more of the model that you're, you're practicing right now. So, um, there's a lot of work to being an operator. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I think some of, you know, I think there's something appealing about uh, how you have it set up. So I'm very personally uh, excited to jump into that. Um, but before we get there, um, I know you and I met at a, at a mastermind in Scottsdale and, and um, you were uh, with the wealth without wall street guys and, and that uh, our mastermind group that we're in um, and you had some uh, copies of a book that I, uh, I took home one copy and I promptly read it and, uh, promptly reached out to you and said, Hey, you'd make a, a great, uh, guest on, on my show, um, from adversity to abundance. So we were chatting briefly before this, uh, about that and, and, and also 
Um, thank you because I've gotten several other guests from that book, <laughs> <laughs> which have been great, but, um, you know, let's, let's jump back to kind of the, the low point for you. Um, and then we'll take it from there. Sure. So in 2011, I got divorced. Um, and with my first wife, we'd been married a really long time. Um, we had kids that were entering their teenage years. Um, I was 48 years old. The real low point for me was when I really kind of sat down in my new house um, and and kind of took stock of where I was and realized on the financial side, what I realized was that I really had a lack, complete lack of investment um, in preparing for retirement and preparing for a college education for our kids. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that was what really weighed on me the most um, because I just felt like, how did we get to this point? You know, mm -hmm. so, so really late in your career, you know, now that's mm -hmm. been a while for me, but um, so it was just set, the, set the scene a little bit. So you have, um, how many kids do you have? I have two kids. So one was a freshman in high school. One was in middle school, uh, a mm -hmm. boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that age when they're, yeah. they're coming into their own and I so can relate to <laughs> the vulnerabilities with their parents, you know? Sure. No, I mean, I can, I can personally relate. I've got two kids my daughter is in 10th grade and, uh, my son is, is in middle school and um I'll be 47 next week so uh yeah. and and marriage is not easy <laughs> yeah yeah um so and I'm sure unfortunately I'm sure a lot of listeners uh, a lot of our listener base I'm sure our listener can relate um to to having gone through a divorce or something similar to that so mm -hmm. um so obviously there's you know all kinds of emotional trauma and, and, you know, relationship, um, pain and all that stuff. And obviously the, the point of our podcast here is not to dwell on that, but that's very real. And, and I do appreciate you, you know, at least sharing that, that, that was there. And then, mm -hmm. um, I guess just, and, and I, and then we'll get to the financial planning piece of it, but, um, uh, what else can you add to kind of from a human standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, what was going through your mind at that point? Well, you know, being an accountant, I knew I had to do something. Mm -hmm. um, the question was where to start. Sure. Um, you know, I think it, the marriage was slowly coming apart for quite a little while. So I mm -hmm. think I wasn't, it wasn't a surprise when it happened. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't think there was as much emotional baggage there. Got it. it was really more worry about, oh, if I really want to, you know, retire when I'm 60 or something like that, sure. how in the heck am I going to be able to do that? And right. between then and now kids going to college, which is not cheap, you know, yeah. and all that, um, yeah. So, Makes so that sense. was really more the, uh, the emotional side of it for me, uh, sure. around that period of time. So, and you, you were just correct me if I'm wrong, but you're making decent money from your, from your salary, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that was the good thing is I had a good job. Um, so, so that wasn't really a problem. Um, mm -hmm. it was just, you know, the net worth, the savings was basically non-existent. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And you didn't have 529s or any kind of plan. I'm nope. not trying to beat you up here. And, and nope. I know Didn't that have any of that, I mean, you know, Russ and Joey would say, Hey, that's a good thing. Right. But you didn't have that. Um, but you just hadn't done much in regard to planning ahead. Again, I think yeah. a lot of people can relate. I'm not trying to, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, uh, place blame or anything. Um, got it. So, so how did you go about, uh, addressing the, addressing the problem? Well, I really, I started just, I think, talking to people that I worked with. Mm -hmm. And I think what really started me 
on the journey that I ended up on was one of my coworkers recommended a book by uh, Robert Allen. It's called Multiple uh-huh. Streams of Income. Yep. And that just completely opened my mind to the fact that, oh, I don't have to have, um, you know, just savings to retire. You can actually have all these other little streams of income you can create that are kind of like little businesses, you know? Yeah. So from there, you know, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And then, you know, there's there's a ton of books that everybody starts following and and really started on that journey of just educating myself, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what really started it. Uh, sure. Yeah. I got the, uh, I recall I ordered and it was for me, a lot of money at the time <laughs> was, uh, I think all the, some big, really thick DVD, you know, set of the, that, the Robert Allen book on, on audio version. Yeah. So I, I listened to all that and of course read rich dad, poor dad as well. So, um, but yeah, it's amazing. We just, you know, it makes sense that you're, when you're in your forties, most people, you know, they, they're, they don't have time to think about the big picture stuff or planning ahead They're They've got mm-hmm. kids, they've got a job, they've got, you know, you've got probably a commute at the time. And I, I yeah. know for me, it was like 35 to 40, you know, early forties, I kind of, what just happened? You know, I don't even, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't even remember. <laughs> um, so, but now, so you're starting to realize that, okay, the traditional way of just, you know, 401k and, um, I have a job, I put everything into my savings into a 401k. There's more there. You have more options. Um, you can think mm-hmm. outside the box, think outside of wall street. Um, so then as you educated yourself, what, what, uh, actionable steps did you take after that? Yeah. So, um, also, I, I should say during this time, I did meet a woman that I fell in love with and we did get married um, nice. and she fully supported me looking outside the traditional uh, traditional world of Wall Street. Right. Which is interesting because her father was a stockbroker or was, a stockbroker, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I, I talked to her all the time. And so in 2015, is when I formed my first business plan and created an LLC, um, you know, and, and she fully supported me on that, which was super helpful um, sure. to have that support. But I started attending meetups and then grew into listening to other podcasts. I started talking to various coaches, as we know, there's a lot out there. Um, and I worked with a couple, didn't really connect, so it didn't really work, you know, but I think the learning for me was just keep trying, keep listening. And um, I know you know this person um, because he's part of our mastermind, but I finally got connected through listening to a podcast, but The Land Geek, Mark Podolsky. Mm -hmm. Yep. um, And really started doing the land investing myself. And that was really the thing that I did that first got traction. Yeah, Uh, well, and I'm actually supposed to be on Mark's show, but he realized he was in, uh, he's in, uh, South Africa, I guess right now. <laughs> and he said, how'd you get on my calendar? I said, well, you were, <laughs> that's the first day you were available in the next two months. So I booked it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Mark was on our show and we talked a lot about his, um, the 2008 crash and, you know, how he had a, his identity was pretty wrapped up in his net worth, but that's, uh, mm-hmm. I recommend the listener go back and listen to that one. That was a really good one. Yeah. Um, but so I imagine, you know, it, it's all fine and dandy to read these books and listen to podcasts. And, and certainly I recommend that. Um, but it's not probably until you see that first maybe deposit and back to you, uh, that it's kind of becomes real. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's totally fair to say. I still remember the first piece of land I sold, um, you know, as a small parcel, but I, I believe I spent, like $650 on a parcel of land. I couldn't believe you could buy <laughs> land so cheap, but then I sold it just within a couple of months for over five grand. Um, <laughs> nice. Cash. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> and so I was kind of hooked, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, this actually works, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. You know, yeah, it's but, not going to, that one deal is not going to change your, no. your life, but it's, it, 
it's the mindset and it, you realize, wait a minute, I can, if I can do this once, I can do it a hundred times. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I actually think the biggest thing I learned there was that coaching is super helpful and sure. I'm a strong believer in education and just talk to other people and learn from other people, you know? And because there's always somebody who's done what you're trying to do, you know, and 99% yeah. of the time we're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're just trying to do That's something somebody else has done. I, I love that mindset personally, because, you know, I'm not trying to be Elon Musk, yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah. you know, that's, uh, but absolutely. Why, why reinvent the wheel? Maybe tweak it yeah. slightly yeah. if you find yeah. a better way or something, but um too much work and, and and there's a proven track record among people who have done this before so couldn't mm -hmm. agree more so uh did you then decide to kind of double down on the land flipping business or or how did you approach things so i think what really happened for me was um it also uh, what i should say is at about the same time that i was starting the land business i worked with a couple other guys to try to just buy a business and this okay. business was in the oil and gas sector and that was hugely learning too we i say we failed um it was a bidding process and we basically were the second highest bidder um, okay. and we couldn't get our bid up higher than that based on what we we're doing so um we learned a ton from that and that's led to a, a lot of other stuff that i'm working on right now and that was years and years ago um so there's experience there but you know, once that happened, I really dove into the land business and was doing that business, you know, buying and selling land, finding virtual assistants to help me, all that kind of stuff for really a couple of years. And then I attended another conference by another um, group and that really changed my mindset. I think I was already open to something different because what I was learning about the land business was that I really liked the business itself. I just didn't mm -hmm. like operating the business mm -hmm. myself. Sure. Um, I wanted somebody else to do it. And I knew I was already starting to invest with other guys who were better at it than me and finding mm -hmm. that that worked just as well. And so I was already in this mindset of, being an investor in a, in businesses that worked or investments that worked. Sure. Partnering with people and just learning to partner with people. And, you know, I, I was, you know, so it was kind of, that was going up while I was kind of on the, a little bit on the downswing with land only because I just didn't like managing the business itself, you know, and I was, so I was learning a little bit about myself. Sure. No. I think you, there's a lot there that you just, that, that I think for the listeners is, is quite valuable. It's very easy to gloss over the deal, the oil and, and gas business that you didn't acquire. Um, and act, you know, for us, it's very easy to uh, almost act like that didn't happen, but mm -hmm. I think that's huge. Um, and then, like you said, learning a lot more about yourself through all of these, uh, this entire process, um, that's, mm -hmm. that's critical. Um, so then, um, too bad you didn't think of the done for you model like Russ and Joey, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and actually, I think about that time Mark Podolsky was starting to put to that deal together. Got it. But I was already having success investing with other guys who were doing it, and I didn't feel like I needed to do his done for you deal. Sure, um, makes at sense. The time. So, yeah. uh, and in fact, today I still have a lot of those land partners. In fact, um. I'm st I'm still trying to extricate myself from all of the work. Yesterday, I was doing a ton of accounting support for my land investments, for gotcha. my putting together <laughs> yeah. you know stuff for my bookkeeper, so we can wrap up year end accounting and and move on to tax reporting. But um, some you know you always have to do a little bit of something. There's always sure. something you know, and and so it, it also keeps you connected to the business, so you haven't totally backed yourself out so you don't even know what's going on yeah know? that's a really good point I, i'm switching uh, bookkeeping teams right now and i get very frustrated with books in general with dealing with it you know every month yeah. and just you know because it's it could be a real pain but yeah i'm trying to continue to look at it like that no this is an important touch point uh, mm -hmm. for me to to stay plugged in i mean that's what it's all about right you're trying to make money <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> 
So, okay. So um, you're still somewhat involved currently with the land business, but um, what other types of uh, deals were you getting into with outside of the land business? Well, it started with that conference I went to. So I was following um, the real estate guys who have mm -hmm. a podcast, pretty yep. well known real estate podcast. And so I went to one of their events called Secrets of Successful Syndication. Okay. And that was hugely eye-opening for me because, I, as I said, I was already an investor with other land guys. Um, mm -hmm. And that whole conference was about how to raise money for your deals with mm -hmm. other investors who just want to be passive investors. Mm -hmm. And once I had seen that, it really opened up my eyes to how easy it was to do that if you just know what you got to do. And my accounting background and finance background kind of put me in that spot. I was like, oh, I get all this financial strategy. That's the easy part for me. That's maybe where I should use my expertise and mm -hmm. partner with people who are really good on the real estate side, mm -hmm. you know, or other types of investments, you know. Sure. And and also maybe the marketing side. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a marketing piece too. Yeah. So not, I, I think that's fantastic too, is you're, again, learning more about yourself through this process, just intentionally deciding to focus on your strengths, you know, what's mm -hmm. kind of, whether that be experience and, or just, you know, God given strengths. Um, and then you're not completely abdicating the, the, your weaknesses, if, but you're partnering with people who are very good with that, those mm -hmm. types of uh, skill sets. And and so, I mean, I love that it's essentially a team sport. Yes. Um, okay. So, and then, and where did it go from there? Well, and I like that you said a team sport. I think I knew that all along. And that's why I have the word partners in the name of my company is because mm -hmm. I always envisioned partnering with people. And even in my corporate job, I, um, I'm constantly looking for people that fit in the team the right way. Mm -hmm. um, well, speak to I, that briefly, if you would, for, you know, just how yeah. to find, you know, a good partner. What, what do you, what do you look for in a good partnership? I'm still learning, but I think the, the first thing that I've learned is that when you have a group of people that have a diversity of knowledge, a diversity of experiences, even a diversity of, of where they grew up and how they look at they, how they were raised, but yet they all have the ability to be open-minded and respect everybody else on the team for their ideas, the team is always going to create better solutions than any one of those individuals. Um, because okay. you're bringing so many different ideas together to to think through from different angles. And that's where I've always found the best teams I've ever had in the corporate world. And that's what I think I have always envisioned for my own company. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think uh, our culture in the world today could um, use a little bit more of that mindset. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, so have, have you along the way had any trouble with regard to partnerships um, or has it, has it gone fairly well? Um, there's been a couple times where I've started to partner with somebody because we, we had, I think what was a, a good idea. And then over time, it just either, either me, I'm not going to say I'm not, you know, Culpable. Sometimes I didn't do what I needed to do. Sometimes the partner didn't do what they needed to do. But we just eventually what we figured out is it, it what we thought was a good idea. Maybe our chemistry did just didn't work and we we didn't partner well. And and you know, we just parted ways and it was it was all um amicable. So sure. no hard feelings. So I haven't had any bad breakups, but yeah, it's just learning, good. you know, that hey maybe we can work together. Maybe we can't, you know, you, you got to get to know people, but back to your, I think one of your earlier questions, I think a rule that I've had for quite a while now is I don't want to invest with somebody if I haven't gotten to know them for about a year. 
No, that's that's I don't want to partner with somebody if I haven't gotten to know them for about, you know, you give them a year's time, you can learn a lot of things about people. And sure. Uh, what and date I, did we I'm meet in Scottsdale? That. Pardon? What date did we meet in Scottsdale? I'm, it was okay. about three months ago. So <laughs> So okay. I don't have a problem if some people, you know, that now invest with me feel like they just want to keep asking me questions and wait. I know there's there's a learning sure. process and there's a comfortability and a trust process that people have to go through. I do, I go through it, you know, so. Absolutely. No, I have a, a very recent example of that. It's not really for a partnership per se, but someone who's interested in my my mortgage note fund and, um, you know, he was on my podcast, but that was about it. <laughs> you know, so he's, he's, he emailed me yesterday and he said, um, you seem like a good guy. I really enjoyed our chat, but how do people check out fund managers? And, you know, so I gave him a whole lot of ideas and the, for me, really, it comes down to here's, here's some references to talk to, mm -hmm. have them give you other references, which I used to, in my former life, we used to call developed leads, but check out my, my reputation doesn't mean that I'm yeah. perfect or can't, can't lose money for you, frankly, because there's always risk. Right. But, yeah. um, yeah. there are lots of ways to, and you absolutely should, uh, research your, your operator, uh, thoroughly. I, I mm -hmm. think that's personally, it's probably more important than researching the the deal itself, but that's yeah. a, that's uh, for another, another day. So I'm glad you haven't had too, too many major uh, bumps in the road with regard to partnerships. Um, and so back to kind of the more, you know, family focus, how was your personal life changing as you started to take action with these, um, these investments? I think the, the biggest challenge was putting in extra time, um, you know, and, trying to find the right balance um, where I still had time for my kids who were, you know, as I was doing this, they're going through high school, starting to go to college. One of them decided to go out of state, you know, and so, so there's all those issues with, okay, how do I still continue to find time for them? Because I'm not only working a full-time job, I'm trying to find time for this business, you know, this sure. investing um, business. And, and also for my, my wife, you know, we were still newly married. Um, sometimes I put in too many hours, you know, working and, and she's like, I never see you anymore. What, you know, what happened here? You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, cause sure. she, she got to know me when I had a job. I, I basically, I kind of changed paths a little bit in the corporate world, which created, you know, extra learning and, and a lot more hours at work too. At the same time that I was starting to try to crank up on an investing business. So both of them were adding hours to my day at the sure. same time. And she was like, he used to have all kinds of time for me, you know, and now you don't and what's going on. And so, you know, sometimes you have to take a step back and make sure you really, what's really important, you know, and, and, and the people in the relationships are always going to be the most important. Um, you know, I can always work longer. Um, by that, I mean, you know, postpone any type of sort of retirement, you know, um, sure. that kind of thing. So, you know, but now is always important with relationships, you know, if you want to, especially, you know, when you're building one with a new spouse, you know, yeah, it's very yeah. important. Um, uh, it's, uh, I really like that. It's, won't spend too much time on this, but it's, it doesn't sell well to, to talk about nuances and it depends and all this, but mm -hmm. there is a season to buckle down and just focus on your work and frankly, not put as much effort into, you know, your relationships in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then things change. And so that's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, so, but, but keeping, you know, the main thing, the main thing, which is really the relationships is, is, is key. So, um, it's hard, you know, to, to, it's easy for us to talk about it on the, on this show, but it's when you're yeah. in it, it's difficult. So that's a lot to juggle. So, um, and then, uh, how did that go from there? Uh, how did things grow, uh, on the investment side and how did that affect your, your, your family life? 
Well, I think the biggest thing I learned that I took from my corporate experience was find people that you can pay to get work done for you. You don't really sure. have to do everything. And that's probably how I moved up as, as well as I have in the corporate world is that I, you know, I, I, one of the things I learned when I was working is you work with some people and that, that manage people and they don't want to give them too much work. Cause they're like, well, what if they get better than me and they take my job away? Mm -hmm. And, but I always had the opposite view was I want to give them everything they can because I want them to be successful. I want them to like what they're doing. And if they want to get ahead, I'm happy to help them get ahead. And all it really does is it makes me look better because my team's getting more work done and better work done. And, sure. and hopefully that helps me too. And it has, um, it played out that way. And so I've, you know, I, I guess I, uh, like your podcast, I have an abundance mentality when it comes mm -hmm. to success, you know, yeah. and, and I, I believe that everybody together can help raise the whole group, you know, absolutely. And, and so, um, I'm always happy to, you know, help the people who, who help me, you know, yeah. um, and I don't mean that in a financial way. I mean that in a, you know, you're, you're doing work for me. I'm happy to, if you want to keep pursuing your career or your goals or your business, I'm happy to help you get ahead too, you know, in whatever yeah. way that I can. Um, yeah, I love that. Instead of approaching people. it, instead of approaching it like a, from a scarcity yeah. fear based mindset, you're approaching yeah. it from an and abundance. Ultimately, yeah. Ultimately that helps you with your time management because you're sure. passing off work to them and letting them do it and get that experience. And, and that works in the investing business too. You know, there's a, I, I want to understand everything that's going on. I don't sure. necessarily want to do everything that <laughs> needs to happen. And I'm happy yeah. to face some people that want a job that want to learn, you know, to let them yeah. do that stuff for me. Well, and, and, and again, you're focusing on your experience, your strengths from your corporate experience your corporate mm -hmm. um career path and taking that to your investing side so yes. you're not entirely yeah. reinventing yourself to go be this passive investor and and i yeah i think this is really you know and it, it gets to lots of nuances but that's that's uh that's very good you're you're looking at your strengths and focusing on those and applying that your experience and skills to the the new thing so mm -hmm. um so then from just from, you know, from the say 2015 through today, how has uh, match real asset partners changed? So now what's really changed was when I went to that secrets of successful syndication, that was a pivot point for me. And um, I started getting out of the land of business other than investing with other successful land um, business people, um, land flippers, let's call them, you know, whatever you want to call them. Um, right. and I still do that. And what I did with match real asset partners is I evolved it more into an investment management company, not one that owns specific investments. Like a, don't think of it like a mutual fund, but think of it like a sponsor for investments. And originally, you know, I was constantly on the track of only thinking about real estate type things, single family mm -hmm. housing, multifamily, self-storage, you know, all the different types of real estate. But there was a key point in that process where I started thinking about, okay, if I'm going to help other investors to invest in these deals too, who do I relate to the most? It's probably people who work in the corporate world like I do. Sure. And what I learned by actually delving into the tax code a little bit is that for people who have a full-time job, you cannot be a real estate professional. Therefore, any real estate you invest in, including getting the, the depreciation benefits of real estate and all those cannot help you with your W-2 income. Yeah. It's active. And in, Passive yeah, it's active, and active, active income, versus right. passive, right? Right. There's there's a code section 469 called the passive loss rules, and they're they're mainly talking. They directly 
talk about the loss pieces, which are the tax deductions, but it affects the income too. Sure. And, but there's a key exception in there. Then that's the thing that I've started focusing on in the last two to three years. And that is any investment that involves the production or working interest in oil and gas is an exception to that rule. So in other words, an investor can be completely passive in that type of investment, but if there's depreciation or drilling costs or other types of sort of tax losses, you can use those to offset your income from your W-2 job. And so I started planning to invest in them myself, and that's where mm -hmm. I started focusing my business on trying to find deals like that, that not yeah. only I can invest in and would help me, but it would help other investors similar to me. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a critical piece. That's a very not well known uh, fact and uh, part of the code. And so, how much did your your experience of of almost buying the oil and gas business help you with regard to understanding that uh, piece of the tax code? It really helped a lot. Um, it does help that I live in Houston, which is you know, sort of the headquarters worldwide for the energy business. Um, I've worked for a couple of companies that were energy related. So it helped that I started putting a lot of this together. Um, ultimately, it's taken me to a place where we're putting together a deal right now that's going to be the biggest deal I've ever put together. And it does involve natural gas. Um the the fun, I think, cool part of it is it also involves helium, which people don't necessarily associate with the oil and gas industry. But um, there's there's huge demand drivers for helium and there's supply constrictions that that just under development, you know, and it's leading to the price of that commodity going up and up and up. And that's one we're putting together um, to offer to investors in 23 and 24. Um, and that's what I'm really super excited about. Now, along the way, yeah. there's a couple of other things I've done too, related to CO2 capture and sequestration and things like that. But all of these things relate to natural gas and that type Got of it. industry. So talk about um, the a, a typical deal structure. It could be this, this deal you just mentioned that you're excited about, but um, what does that look like? Is it a, is it a, uh, regulation D 506 C what, how, how do you structure these deals? So through my education on syndicating deals, um, I learned the difference between 506 B 506 C. Those are the two main exceptions to registering with the sec. Um, I think, I think there's a key point here that I learned that I think most investors or other people who are trying to raise money should learn. And that is what's the SEC's definition of a security. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. their definition is that if an investor gives money to a partner with the expectation that that partner is going to do all the work and create profits for the investor, mm -hmm. that's a security. Yeah. So basically you could have two people involved. One's the operator and one's the investor. And yeah. if the investor is completely passive, it's a security. Yeah. And by by law, that has to right. be registered with the SEC. You get and, into the, the Howey test and all that stuff. Exactly. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of people don't, <laughs> frankly, don't follow it. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. they don't, it, it's with all these joint ventures flying around on, yeah. on Facebook and all this other stuff. And, you know, yeah. so yeah, you can get into some real trouble. Um, yeah. And the SEC doesn't care what you call it. <laughs> the right. way I described it is their definition. Um, but 506B, 506C, all that Reg D stuff, those are exceptions to going through the full registration process. And so they've created these areas where if you just follow these rules and document it, you don't have to completely register it with the SEC. Also, you can avoid all the state um, security mm -hmm. regulations. Um, the reporting and everything. All the reporting, yeah, which to every state that you have an investor in, which um, I, yeah. I you know, comply with all that. Right. So, so to answer your question, though, what I've learned to do is structure all of my investments as 506C, mm -hmm. which means there's two things there. One, mean, it means I can only take accredited investors. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I cannot use or take money from non-accredited investors. And the reason I do 506C is because if you do 506C, you're allowed to market the funds, which basically means I can talk about it mm -hmm. to strangers. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, which means if I'm talking about it on this podcast, that's marketing to people that I don't know, right? Absolutely. And yeah. I would not be able to talk about these on anybody's podcast if I was using 506B, which is the other one. Sure. More of the friends yeah. and family people call it or. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, both of our, our mortgage note funds are 506Cs and, and I, I personally would like to be able to work with non-accredited investors, but the way that the rules are set up. It just, it just makes it a little more challenging. Yeah. So yeah, we've opted very, to go the same way. Yeah. It's very sad because there's so many people that don't qualify based on the rule to be accredited, but they're very smart people. They are very Absolutely. financially savvy and they fully understand the, the yeah. risks of the deal. And why should they be limited just because they don't have enough net worth or they don't have a high enough income? Completely agree. You know? But yeah, my my brother is very smart with this stuff, and he's not accredited. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> he works at a credit union. He's been in the mortgage space, anyway. So, uh, but but the fact is, I, I, I've gone the same route as you as far as um, you know the structure, uh, because these are the rules, and these are from a business and time standpoint, it just makes the most sense. Um, yeah. So, yeah. if I'm a, a passive investor out there. And what what does that look like, you know, for for me, uh, the listener who's a accredited passive investor? Um, what does that look like uh, when they want to work with you? So when they want to work with me, uh, there's a couple of things. I like to have a one on one call with people. I prefer the video call, um, but I'm, I'll do phone calls as well. But it's a little bit of just sort of get to know each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know. You know, if, if you're an investor, what are you looking for? What are your goals? You know, because if you tell me, you might tell me one thing and I'll be like, okay, well, we can't satisfy you that with our investors. But you know what? I know somebody else who has investments mm -hmm. that do satisfy that. And I'll make referrals to those people, mm -hmm. um, make those introductions. But, you know, just trying to get to know them a little bit about what their goals are, what they're looking for, because the first thing I want to do is just help people, you know, help sure. people get what they want. And there's enough people that'll invest in my deals. I don't have to get every person, you know, make it a hard sell to try to get. And I don't really want somebody to invest just because I've, you know, tried to force them to in some way. Sure. I want them to want to invest and it will want them to, it to meet their goals. Also, yeah, yeah. that call gives them a chance to get to know me and who I am and what I do and, and what I like. And, you know, then we've established a relationship, you know, they can have my cell phone number, they can have my email, they can call me or contact me anytime, you know, mm -hmm. to ask me more follow-up questions. That's how I like to get started. And, uh, yeah. and I have an email list, Yeah, but I don't want to bombard people with stuff that they're not interested in. If I've got two or three different types of investments and there's only one that they're interested in, I'm going to make sure they're tagged so they only see that stuff. They don't need to yeah. see the other stuff if they don't like it. No, that makes sense. So briefly, but share the email address that you uh, talked about before we hit record. Yeah. So I created an email address for this podcast. It's abundance at matchrealassetpartners.com. If you send an email to that email address, my team will make sure that um, you get, a, you know, the, the information you need about my company, about me, how you can set up a call with me and we can have that discovery call, as I call it, um, and learn more about the different types of investments that I offer, um, you know, That's and great. things that I'm working on. So I still do have some some rapid fire questions, but before sure. we before we get there, um a little bit more. So what is, you know, as far as the, the deal structure, and let's just talk about the one that you're, you're focused on now. Um, how does that work between you and the operator? How do you, how do you make money? Um, uh, and, uh, cause I, I'm personally, you know, interested in how this works. Um, mm -hmm. how do you structure mm -hmm. that kind of behind the scenes for yourself? Yeah, this one, is is a little bit more complicated than the ones I've done previously. 
because it's really going to end up being a lot more like a business, not just an asset that we own that produces income. Okay. So let me talk a little bit through our plan conceptually. We're still putting this together. Um, I'm ending up, I think I have now four different legal advisors on this deal just to make sure we cover all the aspects um, and a tax strategist as well. But the first step in the process, we've already identified a particular natural gas field where the seller wants to sell it. And okay. one of my partners is, knows this person very well through business experience, multiple years, probably more than a decade. Um, that's our connection with that seller. But we know that this natural gas field has high concentrations of helium in it. And the helium is what we're really after. Okay. So once we buy this field, we will start developing this field um, by doing additional drilling, which will increase production. That's where uh, my, my the, the operating partner who has all the oil and gas experience. He knows that field really well already. Um, and uh, as well as other fields around it. So he knows how kind of all the all the gas flows through that region. And then my other partner on this deal is a, has expertise in uh, the industrial gas sector, which is the sector of, of gas where they learn how to, or they use technology to separate gases at the molecular level. So just think about the atmosphere we're breathing, mm -hmm. that industry can take, take in that air separate out the nitrogen, separate out the oxygen. There's other minute elements, you know, it separates CO2 if they mm -hmm. want to liquefy that, you know, and they, they know how to liquefy it. They know how to separate all these things. So we're going to use that type of technology to separate the helium out from the natural gas so that we can sell that helium. And when we get this deal, the first really big piece of equipment operating we're going to end up with more revenue from helium than we will from the natural gas. Hmm. Wow. So that's, it's, I'm equating it to like a value add project in the real estate world. We're going to buy mm -hmm. a natural gas field. We're going to invest in equipment and create a new value that they're not monetizing right now. Okay. And so um, there's a lot of, there's a lot more legal work on this side because we, um, we need to make sure the tax strategy works. We got to set up the entities properly so that we can pass all the equipment depreciation, drilling cost deductions, all that back to our investors because those are going to be huge benefits for the investors. Um, mm -hmm. Also, we're buying a big asset. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's literally you know something around fifty thousand acres of mineral rights plus wells that are already producing. That's that requires a whole other you know set of attorneys to help us figure that out, um, you know how to structure it properly. But sounds sounds like a lot of a lot of moving it, pieces. It's a lot of moving pieces. Um, that's what I really get excited about. You know, is, mm -hmm. is doing something big like this. Um, but we're gonna we'll raise a lot of money. There's a lot, already a lot of investors who are very interested in it. Um, mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for the investors where they can. They can come in soon as we open it. By soon, I mean hopefully in the next couple months. They can come in later in the year. They can come in in 2024, mm -hmm. whatever point they want, because I think we're going to continue to raise money and invest in this deal for the first two years. Okay. Once we've done that, the cash flow is going to be good. Hmm. I don't, I don't want to yeah. promise too much yeah, but, sure. uh, because it's not all in writing, but I believe it's going to be a good deal for investors. Uh, so there's so much I'd love to, you know, pick your brain about on that, but we just mm -hmm. don't have time. Um, so what's the, uh, I, I guess, you know, why, why wouldn't the seller do all these things? So, the, so the seller's not monetizing the helium right now because mm -hmm. the helium con when the gas comes out of the ground, the helium content is, in in this particular field going to average between one and a half and two percent of the gas coming out of the ground it's a very small amount back when he started developing this field decades ago helium wasn't worth that much so it wasn't even worth the money to try to separate out now that it's 
you know, he's gotten older. He's kind of at a point in his career where he just wants to sell out. Sure. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to, you know, make it good for him where he can sell out and his family can enjoy, you know, what he's built. And we're going to go ahead and do all the additional investment now that's required to go ahead and monetize that helium. Hmm. Got it. Yeah. Cause I think that's a common thought that goes through people's mind, whether we're talking about a single family, you know, rental property, a big multifamily syndication or a business or anything, you know, mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean that the asset itself is that there's anything wrong with it, but it's just, uh, the, the natural life cycle or business cycle in, of the seller versus what you have going on is they're very different. Um, so mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. So you're going to add value and then, uh, any idea how long you expect, uh, the whole thing to, to go on for? It's um, it's going to take us the first two full years to invest and build this up to where we'll really have, um, you know, good revenue stream from the helium. Mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, at that point is when we estimate we'll have significant cash flows that we'll start passing back to the investors. And that'll mm -hmm. continue as long as we operate the business um, or somebody comes in and wants to buy it. Mm -hmm. Now, who would want to buy it? Um, there's some some of the major oil companies do produce helium. You don't really hear about it, but they do. Um, and they're investing a lot of money into it. They could be a buyer. Maybe a hedge fund or private equity fund might be an interested buyer, depending on the, the market cycle and, and who, who that might be. Mm -hmm. It's it probably will be a big enough deal that we might be able to do an IPO and issue stock mm -hmm. and do that. Wow. Um, I've, I've been involved in one of those in my prior, in my career. So I know how much work that is. It's not, not my favorite option, but it is an option <laughs> or we just keep the thing and let it keep producing cash flow. Um, you know, it's, there's enough natural gas there that, that, that field will last a long time. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I like how, you, you know, it's like me buying a particular mortgage note. If I buy it, right. I don't know exactly how it's necessarily going to play out, but I should be good to go regardless of mm -hmm. how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, so rapid fire questions, and then we'll get out of here. Okay. Um, if you could go back and give your 18 year old self some advice, what would that be? I wish that I could tell my 18 year old self, to read all those books that I didn't read until I was 48, 49 or 50, but I'm not sure they existed at the time. Um, but, but be more seek out entrepreneurs and learn from them, you know, That's because good. college, uh, college education was great for me, mm -hmm. but I don't, that doesn't mean it's right for everybody. Yeah. Um, and I, and I felt like my whole life, I always had this entrepreneurial bug, but I just didn't know what to do with it. You know, sure. because I was already in a corporate job and that's what everybody told me to do. And, you know, I would say, make sure you really know what you're doing, you know, not, not what you're doing, but don't, don't just accept what somebody else tells you is the right path for you. Explore mm -hmm. everything you want to explore. You know, yeah. when you're 18, you still got all your twenties ahead of you. There's tons of time to keep learning. Yeah. You constantly can keep learning. No, well, that's, that's really good. Um, if you were given $10 million tomorrow, personally, what would you do with it? I'd invest a lot of it in this deal that I'm putting together right now. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. I guess. Yeah. 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 You must believe in the fundamentals of it. Well, I do. And, and the first dollars going into it are, are my dollars. You know, I'm putting my own money into it to get it started. Um, and, and, and I'm going to be investing right alongside the passive investors with my own money. So, Got it. um, okay. I, be I believe in my own deals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you could eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Only one meal. At this point in my life, it's probably a, a salad that's pretty well mixed with vegetables, you know, a lot okay. of a variety of vegetables in it. Um, I, I just you know, kind of the point where I feel like I need to be healthy with what I'm, what's going in my body. Sure. Makes a lot of sense. Um, 
what's one challenge that you're facing either in your personal life or your investing business right now? Time is still probably my biggest challenge because I mm -hmm. still have that corporate position, but I am actively working on my corporate retirement. I'll ca I call it my corporate retirement because I don't see myself completely retiring from work, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm, you and I are in a mastermind where our goal mm -hmm. is to get to 200% passive income of what we yep. need to live on. I'm pretty close to a hundred percent and nice. I can see the timeline for getting to 200%. So now's the time for me to start working on, on how to, how to exit easily from the corporate world. But I, I want to leave, I want to leave a good legacy behind. I've already found the person who's going to replace me and the executive mm -hmm. team agrees with that person. Mm -hmm. Now is, now is where I'm working on solving that problem. So getting myself out of that business over the next year or two. I love um, it. Yeah. So I can really, really then do what I want to do all the time. Which is what? I love this. <laughs> I love this investing business, but I also want to spend a ton more time traveling with my wife. There's a lot of travel we nice. want to do and we love to do it and, and do some things like that. Fantastic. Um, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to cover? No, I feel pretty good about what nice. we covered. We, we like our guests to feel good at the end. <laughs> so that's good. Um, where can listeners find you online? Uh, you can find me on, on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I mentioned the the email abundance at matchrealassetpartners.com. I really think that's yep. the easiest thing is just send an email Perfect. there. We'll send stuff back to you on how you can get in touch with me and learn all about our business. Sounds great. And we'll put that, uh, that email address and that call to action in the show notes. Um, so yeah, Mark, Mark Livingston, this has been very, very good. I think it's, um, a very, going to be a very relatable episode for, for people. Um, and I just love that you, you know, there's so many things I love about your story. Um, the fact that you were able to draw on your own strengths, your existing strengths and experience, um, and approach, uh, I guess, and then take ownership of your situation. That's one thing that came out to me is, um, you know, you weren't permanently focused on the divorce and the, 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 you know, woe is me type thing. You actually took ownership and took action. And then, um, you know, and then also the team sport thing that we talked about as well, I think is, is a key piece to how you've approached your partnerships and your investing business. So um, this is going to be a, a very, very relatable and very actionable episode for people. So I, I thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me on here, Jamie. Um, I've, I've listened to a lot of other episodes on your podcast and I, I like hearing everybody's stories and um, I do, I do like to talk to people. So if you want to, anybody wants to talk to me, reach out. And uh, let's just talk about how to how to how to get to that passive income number that you want. Absolutely, you know, I love or it. Or any other issue that you know you you can relate to. Sounds great. I appreciate it, Mark. And to the to the listeners out there, we appreciate you, and we appreciate you spending your most valuable asset with us, and that is your time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>